Hi, welcome to Ask a Pastor. This is a podcast and a video distribution we've just been trying here a couple of times. And our hope is really to engage uh, people inside the church, outside the church with questions that you say, I'd really like to hear somebody address this question. And so today I'm joined by Josiah Lewenberger, who serves as part of the staff at Orchard Hill, uh, working with young adults. And we're going to talk about a couple different topics today. We're going to talk about cutting, we're going to talk about dating, and then we're also going to talk a little bit about suicide. Uh, so Josiah, um, one of the questions that, that we've had is, is it a sin to cut? Uh, as you probably are aware, uh, in youth culture, a lot of uh, people will sometimes cut as a way just to feel. And, uh, and so the question is, is that sinful? Is it wrong? And then the, the kind of the second part of that question was, what advice would you give me if I feel drawn to cut? So, uh, so welcome to yeah. Ask a Pastor. Hey, and, thanks. Uh, and uh, why don't you tell us uh, kind of how you see that issue? Yeah. You know, the first thing that I would definitely want to say is that to this person who's dealing with cutting, I'm sorry for the experience of so much pain that you're going through that's led you to that point where you're seeking a release in this way. And I think that something the enemy really wants us to feel is like we're alone in our pain. Mm. No one else gets what we're going through. And so this is the release that we have to seek because we can't go to anyone else with these burdens that we're feeling. And surely no one else can even identify with what we're experiencing. And I think that's a real lie of Satan. I think that each of us experience pain and we can support one another in what we're going through. And there are some really healthy ways that you can seek support and, uh, you know, be able to deal with what you're experiencing. And, you know, people cut for a variety of reasons. I know that really what it comes down to is we all deal with emotional pain. And some people deal with it at such a deep level that they're seeking a release in that way. And so that question, is cutting a sin? I believe that the desire to cut stems from the brokenness in our world, the sin in our world and the brokenness in our lives. But honestly, the answer to that question, is cutting a sin? That's not my primary concern. Mm. I believe that really cutting is a harmful way to deal with our pain. It's a damaging way to deal with our pain. There are much better ways uh, to handle that. And certainly for me as a follower of Jesus Christ, I believe that the gospel gives us a tangible way that we can deal with our pain because Jesus gets us, mm. he understands us, and he did something about our pain in a real and tangible way on the cross. And so we can come to him with our burdens, we can come to him with our pain, and he cares, and he wants to enter into our lives and bring wholeness and bring restoration. Okay, so, so somebody who might listen or have this question and say, okay, but when I try to go to the cross, I don't feel maybe some of the same things that I feel when, when I self-harm. Yeah. Um, what advice or wisdom or what would be the healthy ways to deal with the pain? In yeah. addition, I mean, I, I fully with you, agree, going to the cross. But, but I could imagine somebody listening to that saying, that sounds kind of like, like a church answer saying Jesus yeah. will help you mm -hmm. and they say well I've prayed to Jesus and I still don't feel relief from my emotional pain so so how would you help them yeah kind of kind of experience that surely that's one way of dealing with the pain that you're experiencing mm -hmm. and there are unhealthy ways and there are healthy ways of dealing with our pain mm -hmm. and so from a worldly perspective I think that each and every one of us have a need for relationships and, and spiritually speaking in the church, we all have a need for support, encouragement, accountability. And here at Orchard Hill, we make that available to every person through relationships with pastors. We have great counselors, we have great support groups. And I think that uh, to be able to connect people in our church who are really hurting with those who can come around them and give that kind of support is really important. Mm -hmm. um, being able to connect with others in relationships and be honest about the things you're struggling because we all have those things in our lives. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to healthy ways of dealing with that pain, I think that uh, conversations are very helpful. I think that also things like physical activity mm. can be a really helpful thing. Mm -hmm. I know that for me, when, I, when my tensions are high, there's nothing that calms me down like getting out for a good run. Uh, I know that uh, there are a lot of people who find similar things, uh, hobbies, activities, um, as okay. ways of dealing with that kind of stuff. Yeah, one of the things that, uh, that, that I've 
observed in years of just talking with people around this issue is that, is that as Josiah said, it really is a way to deal with something that's deeper. And if you try to stop doing something on a surface level that's tied to a deeper level, you'll often not actually address the real issue. And so, and that's ultimately where the gospel does come in, is that, is that we have to get to a point where we say, I'm accepted, so whatever it is that I'm feeling, apart from this, I have to find my, my solace or my, my comfort in something that's transcendent, in something mm. that's real. But, but in order to get there, a lot of times, if we skip the step of naming the hurt and talking about why it's not there, that's when I think the, the gospel or the cross will feel superficial. But if we can name that actual hurt, if we can identify it and then come to Christ, come to community, come to accountability, add physical positive activities into our lives, then all of a sudden we find ourselves maybe being able to to overcome the desire for self-harm. Mm, that's um, great stuff. So. So, um, Josiah, uh, another question that, uh, that, that we've seen here is uh, from somebody who says, I see myself as a Christian and find that I have not found a, another Christian to date. Um, and nobody that, you know, is of faith seems to be somebody who I would want to date. Um, so basically help me think that through. So, so what would you say yeah. uh, to somebody who says, you know, I'd like to date a Christian, but all the Christians, you know, that I know are, you know, they don't comb their hair, whatever their, their, their complaint is. Yeah. The first thing I would want to say is I hear you and I don't want to downplay that mm. desire mm. that this person is experiencing that uh, drive for a meaningful connection with another believer and to be able to have that uh, personal relationship where they know they're really supported, cared for, loved. And, uh, I don't want to sound cold in anything I would ever say in counseling this person because that's a really difficult and tough place to be. And I say that because my response is it's worth the wait. Hmm. No matter how hard it is, it's worth the wait because you need to have someone who can be there and support you and trust you, um, not just as a person in your you know, day-to-day activities, but in your faith because our faith in Jesus Christ really saturates and informs who we are and what we do in every area, every aspect of our lives. Mm. And so I know it can be really difficult when you're not finding that relationship and you want it so bad. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with that desire. I don't think there's anything wrong with that drive to have a relationship but I would really encourage this person to be patient and trust that God has their best mm-hmm. in mind. Okay. Uh, you know, I think that sometimes we've heard of missionary dating mm-hmm. and people wonder, hey, maybe a missionary marriage will work mm-hmm. out just fine. You know, here's someone who seems to me, maybe like they're spiritually ripe. Yeah. And if I was to date them, they would get an understanding of what Christian faith is really all about. And I could be that influence in their life that leads them to come to Christ. And certainly we wanna see the people in our lives who are meaningful to us. Uh, we want to see everyone come to know who Jesus really is, but to date with that intention that you're going to convert someone and then you'll have that Christian husband or wife that you've always desired. Right. I think that's really dangerous. Yeah. 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 A lot of times people will, will think, well, I'll date this person. Maybe they'll come to faith. And if not, maybe it's not that big a deal, but to enter life with somebody who doesn't hold what you hold to be at the same level of importance is really to ask for, pain in your marriage and and so i think that's what you're talking about and that's that's a good thing you know one of the other things that that i would add here josiah is that it's significant not just to wait i think that's awesome advice just to say you know what pay attention to the fact that god's timing may not be your timing and and it is worth the wait also a few months ago i did a message and one of the points that i made was that being single is honorable and I was amazed at how many people emailed me, had conversations with me, just to thank me for making that point. And I made it from the scripture. I think it was in our Ruthless series, if you want to go back and take a look mm-hmm. at that. But, uh, but, but the, the, the point that I'm making is that even maybe before we say it's worth the wait is to say, I'm okay being single if that's what God calls me to, because if I'm okay being single, then I'll be a better boyfriend, a better girlfriend, a better husband, a better wife. But if I'm, if I'm uh, making that something that I have to have, 
then what I'm doing is I'm elevating it to a level of idolatry in my life, and I'm, and I'm in many ways um, showing that I'm not healthy enough to be in relationship um, because I'm not okay being alone. And, and so I think there's, uh, now what's hard about that is when somebody says, well, I'd like that to be true of me, but it's not true of me. What I really want right now is to date somebody and I'll take somebody, anybody, if they're cool, I don't care about their faith. And, and, and I think what, what's important there is just to keep coming back and saying, saying it may feel good now, but, and, and that's just what you were saying, but that's where down the road it will not play out well. And one of the things I can say, I've, I've watched a lot of people um, date and marry somebody that they said wasn't quite there spiritually. And, and one of the things that's, that's always true in, in people who get married is what you think will be an issue and think is a small issue usually becomes a bigger issue later once you're married. And so to think that things will change for the positive is usually just wishful thinking on that issue. So, so thank you, Josiah. Here's here's yeah. one other uh, just question that that's kind of come up, and this one's uh, maybe a little deeper, and and that is just saying, what do I do if I come across a friend who is suicidal? Now, you know, sometimes when people ask the friend question, you say, well, are they are, are they asking for themselves or are they asking truly for a friend? But, mm. but let's just for a moment assume that this question is truly about a friend. Well, what do you do when, when somebody hints at, at taking their own life as a friend? Yeah. First thing I would say to them is thanks for caring enough mm. to let me know that you're struggling to this extent. Mm -hmm. because there can be a real temptation with suicidal ideation to hide and say, mm -hmm. this is so messy that I can't let anyone really know what I'm going through. And so I've got to sort this out on my own. And that can take people to some really dark places. And so I thank the friend for caring enough to really bring you into that. Mm -hmm. I think probably the most important thing you can do for them is to listen and to hear them and to be there for them. There can be a temptation for me when I've counseled people who are going through these times where they're really struggling with suicidal thoughts to feel like I've got to give them the perfect words. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of pressure to put on ourselves. Really what they need is someone who cares and someone who is willing to listen and just be there. Okay. And uh, when is it time to let somebody else know? Yeah. And to make sure that you're not bearing that alone. Because yeah. I, I know for me, one of the things that that I don't feel qualified to do is to assess who's taking it, like how serious are they? I don't feel like I have that expertise. Yeah. So, so, so when, when do you say this isn't enough for me to listen and, and encourage, but I need to actually help them get help? Yeah, I think as soon as they open the door to the conversation to discuss you know, the challenges that they're processing, that's when we say to them, because I care for you, I want to bring some more people into this conversation mm -hmm. because we all need a team around us to help us out when we're going through difficult times. And certainly in contemplation of suicide, there's a need for someone to have a pastoral relationship. There's a need to bring in counselors, uh, family members, and even a physician uh, to mm -hmm. assemble that team around a person to say, hey, God has made us as physical, spiritual, and emotional be beings, and we need to be cared for you know, with our complexity in consideration. Okay, so what if they say to you, I don't want anyone else to know? Yeah, let me put that back to you, Kurt. What would you say? <laughs> I get asked the questions <laughs> here. Um, it, well, a couple things I would say. Um, first of all, I would say anytime somebody prefaces something they're going to say with, I'm gonna tell you something, but nobody else can know, before you let them tell you what they're going to tell you, say, hold on a second. I have a couple exceptions to that. If you've committed a crime, uh, if you're going to harm yourself or others, and I often will say to people, and I reserve the right to tell my wife anything I want to tell my wife. So don't tell me that you're, you know, something you don't want me to tell my wife. Yep. Um, and, and the reason I, I'll do that is, is I never want to be put in a box where somebody says, mm -hmm. hey, I'm going to tell you something, but you can't tell anybody else. And then they say, oh, I'm going to go you know, hurt myself or I'm going to go do something else. And yeah. you promised you wouldn't tell anybody. And so, so some of that you can preempt by saying, I'm not going to um, agree to that. 
and I don't think that's just for somebody who's, who's in the line of work that I'm in as a pastor who says, or a caregiver that, that I need to do that. I think as a friend, I, I would even say that to somebody. Um, so basically, if, if you're gonna tell me about something that's, that's criminal that you did, um, don't ask me not to say anything. Don't uh, tell me something about hurting yourself or others unless you expect me to tell others. And for me, it's my spouse uh, are the three things. Yeah. But, but let me put it back to you again. Yeah. So, so what if you didn't expect it? Somebody got out the idea that, hey, mm-hmm. I'm going to um, maybe hurt myself. And then they say to you, and now I don't want you to tell anybody. Yeah. What I would say to them is, I don't want you to think I'm betraying your trust, but because I care about you so much, I'm not going to listen to you in this moment because I know that you're in a place where Mm -hmm. you're not able to seek out the help that you really need. Mm -hmm. And so I would let them know I very much care. I am here for them no matter what. And I'm going to bring some people in here who can join this team effort to get you well and move through this. Uh, The other thing that I would really let them know is that I believe that there's a hope for each and every one of us that God can meet us in our situation in the midst of what we're going through, give us the grace to walk through it, even if you don't see it yourself. I believe that God is powerful and he's able to bring life out of death. I mean, that's what the gospel is all about, that God can bring restoration out of even the most ugly situation. Mm -hmm. The death of his son on the cross, God brings new life to anyone who would trust him. Yeah. And so I would share that hope with the person, whether they're a believer or not. Right. And I would also let them know that I'm going to continue to be praying for them, yeah. um, that God would intervene into their life and in their situation yeah. and give them hope. And, and if you're, you're listening to this, watching this, and this isn't about a friend, maybe you're a person who says, I have had thoughts of self-harm, of hurting myself. Uh, as Josiah said, uh, there is hope. The hope is found in Jesus Christ. Uh, but there's also help. Uh, there are people who would be willing to help you, um, not just at Orchard Hill, probably any church that's around where you live that you've driven by a hundred times would probably have people there who are willing uh, to help you walk through and find footing and give you support community uh, to find your way back to a place where, where you don't want to hurt yourself. And so uh, don't stay alone in your hurt, but instead be, be willing to, to reach out and tell somebody and ask for help. Uh, Josiah, one more question, and this wasn't on our topic list, but uh, as, as a person who works with young adults, one of the things that we see and hear from young adults a lot today is I'm spiritual, but I don't need the church. I don't need institutional religion, institutional religion's broken, so I'm going to be spiritual, have my relationship with God, but I'm going to do it on my terms, my ways. I don't need any official organization. Uh, I don't need any of the corruption, any of the junk that goes with the church in order to to have a good relationship with God. What what would you say to somebody who who has that perspective and really uh, needs to, um, kind of, uh, grapple with that or wants to grapple with that, or they probably don't Mm -hmm. even want to grapple with that. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that something the Bible teaches that I've really found to be true is that when we're not connected to community, we really are the ones who miss out. Mm -hmm. Our Christian faith is about more than just ideas that we understand in our mind. So what if they say, well, I have my community and it's with my friends when I go to the bar and we talk about spiritual things. So we have community. And it feels more real than when I'm in a small group at church. I mean, how how would you help somebody think about that? I think that the difference that we experience in the church, being around people who are at different phases of life, have different gifts and abilities, Mm -hmm. that's something that Mm -hmm. God uses to grow us and refine us and allows us to be on God's mission together. Because when we connect with other people who are believers, we're able to be a, you know, a complete representation of the body of Christ. And then we can make a real difference in our community because my faith isn't just about me and Jesus. It's about me being able to reach out to the world with the good news uh, that's powerful to change people. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's one part of it. I think the other part of it is that no one of us has a perfect understanding of who God is when Mm -hmm. we're all alone and trying to figure things out. Mm -hmm. We need people who can guide us and correct us because we tend to see things in a myopic way when we're left to ourselves. And so we need people who can help us stay on track and to really understand God's word clearly mm-hmm. and to also just keep us accountable and support us mm-hmm. and encourage us in our own personal lives. What, 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 how have you found being part of a church mm-hmm. personally to yeah. have 
helped your own life? Yeah, for me, I can't imagine walking through my life with Christ on my own because it's really through relationships that I came to understand what God's grace is all about. Part of my own story is that I was raised in a really religious context, and it was a great place, and I knew a lot about God. But as I grew, I kind of came to understand that a lot of my relationship with God was based on my own performance, how I felt like I was doing in my Christian walk. And it was through some friends in the church coming alongside me and saying, hey, I see that you're basing your relationship with God on how you think you're doing for him, when really what the Christian faith is about what it's all about is what Jesus has done for me. And coming to that understanding gave me a real sense of freedom and a new excitement about God's grace in my life. And that's not something I ever would have figured mm. out on my own. Mm. It was only because of people who really knew me and people mm -hmm. who really cared about me that they could speak that word of truth to me, which is absolutely mm -hmm. from God's word. And it's not something I would have picked up on my own. Mm -hmm. And so I thank God for Christian community and the way that he's grown me and my understanding of his grace through being connected in relationships connected. in the church. Yeah, thank you. You know, if, uh, if you're still listening to this and you have been a person who says, you know, I can be spiritual without church, in many ways you're right. Um, you don't have to go to a building in order to hear teaching, to worship, to read your Bible, to pray, to consider yourself somebody who's a follower of Jesus. But in many ways, what, what church is, is it's an opportunity to come together with other imperfect people and do life together. And, and there's two important facets of that, that that really move us from simply saying, I'm part of a religious organization to something that's life-changing, as Josiah was talking about. Well, one is we move from being simply a consumer to being a contributor. And, and what I mean by that is, is if we're always saying, I just pick when and where and how I receive any input, we're nothing really but, but consumers and we're treating our spiritual life like we treat any other entertainment or, or kind of environment. And there's something about moving into a space where we say, I'm part of something, not just for what I get, but to be a part that actually lets it become more real. And then the second part, and again, Josiah alluded to this, is really that then when we find ourselves in some of the key moments, and what we've talked about in this uh, podcast here today is we've talked about the idea of cutting self-harm, of suicide. We've talked about dating and feeling alone, all things that, that, that if we approach them purely to say, well, how can I get the help I need? We won't have the help we need unless we've invested when we didn't need the help a lot of times around people mm. uh, who will then be able to walk with us. And, and yeah. so there is a payoff to us personally, but, but it's often by saying, I'm going to put my feet in a place and be part of a place whether or not I, I feel that or experience that. So we're gonna have to leave it here. Uh, Josiah, yeah, thank you for thank joining you. us. And uh, if you have questions, you can send them to askapastor at orchardhillchurch.com and we will try to address your question uh, in a future episode. Thank you, have a great day.